guy. What created Bloody Sam? Mm. Let's get into it, Wayne. Born into wealth, Wayne. Family history in the timber industry. Lumber mills. The high Sierra mountains of California, which to this day, which to this day, Wayne, which is still referred to by the locals as Peck and Pa Mountain. Mm, that's quite an honour, you have to say. I think he grew up, it's, it's interesting watching a Peck and Pa film, the aesthetic, the tone, the themes, the morality of it, that he actually did come from quite a well-to-do background, because I believe his father was a lawyer, one of his parents were, was a lawyer, right. and he grew up in this very kind of privileged background, and he spent his time a kind of, of an outdoorsman, like you say, going through these mountains, and that did kind of shaped the aesthetic of his films. It was, I'd say, more the kind of disillusionment he started encountering as he grew older. Well, I think within this world, he's a frontiersman, let's say. He's the mountain man. He's a pioneer of the early America. And I think that's why a lot of his films are in the Old West or the changing of the West. And as a teen, he was quite wayward, quite lost. He was essentially a rambling cowboy <laughs> in, a, in a wealthy family. His father signed him up to the Marine Corps. And this is important. If you're talking about what forms somebody, what creates somebody, okay, he goes into the Marine Corps on the behest of his father to put some structure into his life. Right. He didn't participate in combat, though he was sent to China to disarm Japanese soldiers and repatriate them after World War II. It was during this tour that he witnessed the brutality of combat, seeing prisoners literally being pulled by an apparatus by their genitals and dragged behind a jeep and other acts of senseless violence. Now, these acts, they weren't committed by the US forces, but the US forces were not permitted to intervene. So you had to watch this as a bystander. And how is he supposed to feel as someone who was essentially forced into the situation, forced into the military? And he obviously has, maybe had kind of high ideals thinking he's maybe going to make a difference. And he sees something like this. Not only is he witnessing this, he's being told he can't do anything to stop it. That begins that that disillusionment, that rebelliousness, which would essentially become kind of a trademark in his work. It probably formed a good part of his personality. Mm. He was known as being mercurial, often difficult, full of contradictions. <laughs> Here's a little juxtaposition what I've always found fascinating people, like what drives them, okay? On one hand, his treatment of women was brutal and misogynistic. Yeah. And this isn't just in the films. I'm on about real life. There are stories of women running from his trailer in tears. Mm. So God knows what was going on behind those closed doors. But they said, look, he's, he was also a sensitive guy with a sense of lyricism. His love of sunsets, poetry, and friendship, which he's been noted as. That's a weird contradiction. Mm. If... The public at large had known about this peck and pole romanticism, about the love of sunsets, etc. It really would have undermined his character because he was known for being abrasive and combative. I think he was, he probably had a lot, got into a lot of fights. He was combative with a lot of people he worked with, particularly producers who he pretty much loathed. Well, look, one of his close friends said he thinks he had a deeply feminine side mm. and hypothesized that his brutality was an attempt to cover this perceived femininity. It, he's kind of overcorrecting. He's got that thing buried deep inside him, but he's trying to demonstrate, like, I'm not this kind of guy, this is the kind of guy I am. That's why he, see, he cultivated this rugged personality. Some of it natural, his you know, years yes. in the mountains, etc., but I think some of it was a bit of a fabrication. Well, look, this contradiction is exemplified when he and his friend were in a whorehouse way. Of that's that's very peck and pie. <laughs> Sounds like the kind of place he would go, yeah. Well, they were filming Major Dundee. Major Dundee is the Charlton Heston Western from the 60s, and they were in Mexico. They were seated at a table with a prostitute who was coughing with suspected tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And his friend said not a word to this prostitute. You know, she's a prostitute, this is Mexico, she's lower than them. When she got up to leave and check on her child, because the child was upstairs in this establishment, Peckinpah turned to his friend, irritated, and said, for Christ's sake, don't you know that is a human being? <laughs> this is what we're saying. And I think this is, runs through Peckinpah's films. I think these films were kind of a way of him to channel this. He was able to channel this through his films, through his characters, through his themes. Can Peckinpah have been so awful? Because he had a posse, Wayne. They were yes. called Peckinpah's posse. The, pe the Peckinpah posse. Chris it's a hard thing to say. Say that when you've had too many tequilas. <laughs> Chris Christopherson, LQ Jones, James Coburn, War Notes. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good company to be in. Ben Johnson, Slim Pickens were other ones. Slim Pickens. <laughs> Slim Pickens. I love that name. <laughs> the interesting thing I found out with the posse is the kind of time they were around because Peck and Peckinpah was working on a TV show called The Westerner. Yep. He did direct a lot of TV, a lot of Westerns. Well, The Westerner was his baby. That was basically his thing. Yeah. And he kind of got this troupe as well, Warren Oates, and he got this troupe together. It's interesting that they seem to have a very hard time working together. There was these exhaustive shooting schedules, they say, 
pick and power, he would overshoot and he would overwrite and then he would cut everything down later on. It seemed like everything was a conflict. Here's a story I like. Uh, have you heard of the Bathurst? It's this famous race in Australia. No. Someone made the joke about the Bathurst. They said the Bathurst is where all these Australians all get together one time a year, a massive fight happens, and then in the middle of it, a motor race breaks out. Kind of feels <laughs> like a peck and paw film. All these people come together, a massive fight happens, and a movie comes out of the middle of it. That's that's kind of what it feels like, that constant combativeness. I think it really aided the film, aided the aesthetic, aided that, that kind of almost nihilistic feel. I heard a lot of peck and paw films direct, uh, described as nihilistic. Don't necessarily always agree on that. I would actually say this film is teetering on nihilism more than any film we've covered mm, before. Possibly, yeah. Would you agree? Would you agree? I, and also because Peckinpah said this is the film, I believe this is the one he had final cut on, this is the only one that wasn't interfered with. Yep. That's interesting, the fact that that is the kind of closest film to him and, as you say, kind of the most nihilistic. But as we're saying, this Peckinpah posse, Wayne, we have Warren Oates. Now, Warren Oates is a Kentucky-born hillbilly. Mm -hmm. now, <laughs> yeah. now, I was recently working a job and it was this Florida family staying in this holiday home and they relayed that where we live, which is somewhat rural area of Scotland, he said, with all our lush green hills, it reminded him of Kentucky. He said there's not much of an equivalent to most places in America, especially Florida where he lived, but if he was to appropriate where we are to somewhere in America, he would say Kentucky. So maybe there's a bit of a Warren Oates in us. There could be, yes. Yeah, right. that, that kind of rugged, outdoor, rugged outdoorsy kind of and thing. And Warren Oates is that kind of, he's that great character actor. He's got an interesting face. He's got a, a thinking face. He's got a naive face. He's got a hard-lined face, a hard-weird mm. face. But at the same time, it can also be a face that is weasley, that is cowardly. It's got all these tr contradictions within his face. In this movie especially, he is very distinctive. He has a very distinctive look about him. He kind of plays that that sort of outsider. Like, like Peckinpah, he was himself. Peckinpah was a man who was kind of ripe for parody. Did you ever see some of the sketches people did making fun of him? Like John Belushi did a sketch oh, on Saturday Night Live, on Saturday Night yeah, Live yeah. where he was Peckinpah directing a romantic comedy who hated Beecham with every single take, every female line delivery from the heroine, and he would just get up, casually slap the actress, then he'd go back and direct again, over and over <laughs> again. Even better, I thought, Monty Python did a sketch called Salad Days. It's a scene in a park, very upper class, kind of talking, oh, mom, yes, let's go play a game of tennis, let's have a cup of tea and crumpets. What you think of as very right. stereotypically upper class thing. And then someone throws a tennis ball, let's have a game of tennis. Someone throws a tennis ball, it hits him in the nose, nose explodes, blood everywhere, arms start coming off, hands start coming off. It's it's very much what the kind of thing you'd see in a peck and paw film, that very brutal, bloody, quite shocking violence. Also, Peckinpah absolutely loved that sketch. He wasn't sensitive about that. He would show it to his friends. That's how much he loved it. And you can't talk about Peckinpah without talking about The Wild Bunch. I watched The Wild Bunch earlier this week. It's kind of his seminal film, his sort of seminal statement, because the film was a reflection of Peckinpah's thoughts of Vietnam at the time. And we've talked about films that expose truths that the public don't want to hear. Now, uh, what's interesting, we're saying The Wild Bunch... We're saying violence, okay. For the bank shootout in the Wild Bunch, that great scene, that great sequence. Peckinpah, he ran six cameras, all at a different speed, placing emphasis on the more gruesome elements. Now, Sam said his intention for this, you know, using slow motion to emphasise the violence, is to take this facade of movie violence and open it up and get people involved in it. It's brutalising and it's awful. It's not fun and games and cowboys and Indians. It's a terrible, ugly thing. The slow motion also makes it harder to miss. I think that was deliberate as well because there are a lot of very kind of quick cuts in the Wild Bunch, especially during the shootouts, but many of the actual scenes of people getting killed, they are done in slow motion, kind of as a way of emphasising, a way of underscoring that that event. But this wasn't first used by Park because if you can remember, I think it was a couple of years before in Arthur Penn's film, it was used effectively at the climax of Bonnie and Clyde. The argument could be made that Bonnie and Clyde is the film that kind of pushed Hollywood into new Hollywood. As I well. have heard people saying that is the kind of definitive. It's it's hard to find an actual starting, but some people have said Bonnie and Clyde was like the catalyst for the new Hollywood movement. 